Stanford University. Well, thank you guys. Uh, we're, uh, we're thrilled to be here to talk a little bit about iteration. Um, Bill was telling me before I came up here that uh, I was going to ask uh, how many people have been in startups or have been involved with companies. You know, he told me that you guys are far and away uh, uh, excelled in that area, so I might be asking you some questions on how to iterate. Uh, but the whole key to iteration, and as you guys know when you have a startup, is that you're constantly iterating. So uh, what I thought I'd do today is kind of go through a high level, uh, give a few examples, very simple examples of iteration. Let Sanjay talk to you a little bit about Crowd Factory because it's one of our portfolio companies that has done a phenomenal job at iterating to success. Uh, and then as part of the workshop at the end of the class, it'll be a challenge rel uh, related to Crowd Factory. So with that, let me, uh, let me get started. And uh, if you guys have any questions, by all means, you know, pop in uh, during, the, during the presentation. So the first thing uh, you guys want to make sure when you're, when you're starting your company is understand what your technology and capabilities are. Uh, and then understand what your goal is. Uh, because it's almost impossible to iterate if you don't know from where you're coming. So understanding your technology, the, capable of, uh, the capability of your technology, and then how that can iterate to, uh, to drive it. The next thing is probably the hardest thing to do for companies is understanding what your company's, or excuse me, your customer's needs are and what your market opportunity is. So many times companies get started in a vacuum. Uh, they come up with a great idea and they think, oh, once we build it, it'll sell itself. You know, it's the old the field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. That doesn't exist in the real world. You have to go sell it. You have to understand your customer's needs. Uh, the product that you have, the technology you have, may fit some percentage of your customer's needs. Knowing that to iterate to get to 100% so that they gladly give you a check for your product is the key. The key, one of the keys in iterations is what I like to call short feedback loops. You can iterate a million times, but if you create an iteration that takes you a year to find the answer, you may not have a year's of, uh, length of runway. So try to create short feedback loops so you can learn from that iteration and then go on to the next experiment. Uh, understand that the iteration takes place in every part of your business. Your technology, your product, your business model, your pricing model, your sales strategy, your marketing, your positioning, your value prop. You never get it 100% correct. You'll never get it 100% correct coming out of the gate initially. But the idea is that you iterate to success. Find out what works, keep doing that. If it's not working just right, find out why. Those short feedback loops are so important. Um, I'm going to give you a few examples and let Sanjay uh, talk to you a little bit about Crowd Factory. Uh, one of our portfolio companies is called Invivo Data. They do uh, electronic diaries for uh, clinical trials. So if you're in a uh, clinical trial and you're a patient and you're actually having to report your outcomes, you used to do it in a paper diary, you now do an electronic diary. Uh, this is a company that was having difficulty selling. Their sales ramp just wasn't, wasn't going fast enough. So they tried a whole bunch of different things, but one of the things that really worked for them was they created a separate arm, a separate product, and that was a consulting uh, division. They were very strong in the behavioral science of collecting data in clinical trials. They came at, at it as consultants. So what they did was they created a consulting arm to basically go upstream and seed business opportunities that would then matriculate into trial studies for them. The other thing they did was they realized that they couldn't go in and sell this directly all by themselves. They had to have partners. Those two things took the company from doing about two million uh, revenue per quarter to now doing north of 10 per quarter. And it was pretty much those two things that drove most of it. Uh, we have another company called Axiant, which does uh, on-site and in the cloud backup recovery uh, for SMBs. Uh, one of the things that they had initially on uh, challenge was their product wasn't a perfect fit for their channel, for their customers. Uh, what happened was, was that most of their customers were MSPs. And as an MSP, you want to have, uh, if you're going to be doing backup and recovery for a lot of your clients, you want to have a single console that you can look at and see at all your 50 clients, did the backup happen last night, everything work out fine. Their product was initially designed for a single sign-on. 
So as an MSP, signing on, signing off, signing back on for the next client. Uh, that simple adoption, that iteration in the product, allowed for the MSP market just to explode. Uh, and this is a company that is, is doing extremely well. They're on a run rate right now of about 10 million, recurring revenue going to about 40. Yes. What's MSP? Uh, managed service provider. So a uh, managed service provider would be like an IT consultant who would manage small, medium-sized businesses, their IT function. Uh, you don't want to have to do all that internally, so you outsource it. Uh, an MSP would come in and say, okay, I've got 50 clients. I'm managing your network for you, uh, whether it's on-site or in the cloud. But again, uh, I'm doing that as a service. You're paying me, right? Uh, if, I'm do if I'm responsible for your backup, the old Symantec backup exec, which is old school, but it's unbelievable how big that market is on, in and of itself, uh, never works properly on a regular basis. So now as an MSP, I can go in and go to every one of my clients on a single console and say, everything backed up fine, I can now go on to my next project. Uh, persistence. Uh, this is for Bill's sake, because uh, Persistence was somewhat of a competitor slash partner with BEA back in the day. Uh, one of the challenges that we had was is a very long sell cycle. It was the old enterprise model. Uh, and we were banging our heads against the wall of how do you shorten this cycle? Uh, it was a very technical sell, uh, required months, months of selling. Now, the contracts were hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, but it was a very long sell cycle. One of the things that we did early on, this was back in 95, I guess, uh, was we brought engineering into the sales process much earlier and actually created sales engineers uh, and changed our entire selling model to have a sales guy and a sales en engineer. Um, totally different, you know, small iteration, but that one small iteration made a huge impact in shortening the sales cycle and then driving the sales round. Uh, these are just a few examples. We're going to get into a few more, particularly as Sanjay gets into CrowdFactory. What I'll do now is I'll turn it over to Sanjay to give you guys a little bit of background on what CrowdFactory does so that you have a little bit more understanding, particularly for the workshop. Terrific. Thank you, Greg. Hey, thanks everybody for letting, uh, letting us come by and talk. I think what you're doing is, uh, is terrific because this is exactly the kind of real world, uh, sort of pragmatic stuff that as you all you know, are building companies, um, you need to be thinking about uh, because I'd love to say uh, that now you guys are probably smarter than me. I had a finance and marketing background, um, but I never got it right on you know on the first try on anything. So um, this iteration topic I think is is highly relevant. Um, how many of you have looked at CrowdFactory website, video, etc.? Uh, just so I know, that's fair. Good. So. I'll give you the, uh, the commercial without giving you the commercial, right? There's the, uh, the obligatory NASCAR slide. Uh, everybody's got uh, great logos. We've got you know, great customers uh, as we've been scaling. We'll talk a little bit about where we've been and where we're getting to, but where we are uh, is think about it as a social marketing platform. We talk about this as social campaign management. Fundamental concept and premise, you know, back to Greg's thought about know where you want to go is there is a whole lot of marketing money spent out there, right? Always has been. That number keeps getting bigger every day. Then along comes this thing called social, right? Now, what opportunity disruptively does that present? Fundamentally, how do you make every marketing dollar you're spending look like two? Because you've tapped into the power of that social graph. You know, I talk about this sometimes as C2C marketing, right? You know, the consumer's taking over. It's not B2B anymore or B2C. You know, stop kidding yourself. The reality is this is C2C marketing. So how do you automate a word of mouth lift off of everything that you're doing? And so, you know, I, we talk about this isn't about creating social campaigns. This is about making all campaigns social, right? And then it's a big, big opportunity, right? Uh, and so that's what we've been after. The thing that has made us unique is, uh, and again, we'll talk about how we got there, because it wasn't that we figured it out right away, uh, is that we made this stuff turnkey and easy. Now, like I said, I'm a marketer by trade, so I can make fun of us all and sort of say, it's got to be easy for us, right? We learned that uh, along the way. Uh, two, cro it's got to be cross-channel, right? We don't think in terms of these silos of, hey, I'm just going to do this fun thing on Facebook, but what about the 90% of my traffic that's sitting on my email campaigns, my website, 
you know, landing pages, et cetera, how do you make this stuff cross-channel? You know, the data. Ultimately, it's all about the data. Right? If you look at any of the surveys in social, the number one pain point that everybody reports is, I can't measure this social thing. The number two problem they report is, I can't measure this social thing. <laughs> so you, the data and the analytics are really important. Um, so that's what's made us different. That's what's earned us a lot of the awards and accolades. Um, how does it work? What does it look like? Something like this. You know, uh, think Britney Spears. Uh, Sony is a client of ours, right? The marketers at Sony have got to launch Britney's new album. And by the way, Britney hasn't had an album in a long time. She's had some personal problems. <laughs> so they're going to spend a lot of money. TV ads, email, banners, you name it. All driving people to Britney.com. That's committed dollar spend. So if I'm going to spend that money, why the hell wouldn't I, pardon my French, give those people a chance to go get 10 of their friends? And so that's what they can do with the platform, is go ahead, grab a Crowd Factory application, you know, one of the many, one of these is a group, uh, it's a group offer, think Groupon for the enterprise. And so when somebody hit Brittany.com, up pops our application and says, hey, terrific, you're here. Go get 10 of your friends to come check this out. And if you do, everybody will get 20% off the pre-order on the album before anybody else gets access to it. So what's notable is, you know, Jane Smith stays on the Brittany site doesn't get pushed to Facebook. You spent money to get her there. You want to keep her there. Lots of other social stuff will push somebody away to Facebook. Keep her there. But what's happening is out on Jane's feed is a message from Jane, not from Sony. Because all the statistics are that if there's a message from Sony on your Facebook wall, you'll ignore it 85% of the time. Not because Sony's bad people or that Britney sucks. It's because you recognize it as an ad. And that's not why you're on the social network. But if it's a message from my friend Jane, I'll pay attention to it 85% of the time. So I, as a marketer, get to have my cake and eat it too. Because Jane is sending the message, but I actually get to help craft it. Right? Out of the Crowd Factory application, I get to control some of the branding, some of the messaging. Jane can make it her own if she wants. And then embedded in that are all of our tracking mechanics. So as her friends interact with that, come back, et cetera, we're tracking all that data. The folks at Sony can see in real time, you know, lots of people are seeing this thing, not that many interacting with it, maybe we should tweak the offer, or lots of people sharing, but not that many people coming back, maybe we've got to change some of the creative. And we're building this person-level database now. It goes beyond the Omniture web trends, sort of click tracking now. I got a database that says Jane pushed my message out four times, brought 1,900 impressions to me, and I got 33 people back and two converted. And now I can use that in my next marketing cycle. On that Sony number, how does it interface with the web page? Like, does your team just like, is it an ad that pops up? I mean, because a lot of it. It can, be, it can be any of the above. So this goes back to that cross channel point. So uh, we can trigger off an event. So, meaning, literally, when somebody hits the web page, it triggers you know, essentially a hover uh, over. Uh, or we can sit right on the web page. Or they could hit a different button and that pops up as a tab on, your, on their Facebook page. Or they can hit a different button, this thing pops into their email template, right, uh, into their email engine. Wherever they want to put it is, you know, where they can put it. Essentially, it's, you know, I think about it as uh, I was an old baseball player, you know, it's, you got a big catcher's mitt. You got lots of traffic coming at you. You want to put this stuff in the path of as much as you possibly can because it's a numbers game, right? Because not everybody's going to decide to go tell their friends about it. But if you get enough people to tell their friends about it, you get this huge viral effect. So that's where we are. We'll have lots of fun talking about how we got there. Any questions at that point? Do you have to be friends, or if you have your settings open so that it's your wall is open to the public, can anyone click on it? So uh, once it's on your wall, it's all about your, your settings, as you say. So whoever has uh, visibility, uh, to your feed, uh, we'll also see it. So at that point, if again, if... So that's a friend. Like anyone that clicks on my link is a friend. That's right. That's right. That's right. So is part of the value proposition that you would then target uh, the users who are best at spreading your message when you do future campaigns? Or how are the customers using it? Yeah, that, that's exactly it. And, but the inverse is also true, right? So you might see, as a result of some data like this, uh, somebody who shares a ton of my stuff. 
but just hasn't managed to get a lot of people coming back. That may mean <laughs> they don't have a lot of friends. Who knows what it means? Uh, but it tells me something about that person, right? They, they love my brand, et cetera. So now I can think about how I might activate them. On the other hand, we've seen clients find these people who just shared their thing once, but they brought 2,000 people back. What? Who is this person? What? I'm going to go reach out to them with a different sort of offer or a different communication, et cetera. So you're exactly right. All of that data tells you something that you can use to segment, to target differently as you go back around the horn. So Brittany's album uh, release sounds to me like a campaign and says that it has a, a deadline, right? Are you yep. doing these on a campaign by campaign basis, or do you have any ongoing sort of semi-permanent relationships? Great question, because that's one of the challenges we'll, uh, we'll talk to you guys about, is how do you not have this be restricted to what we call episodic? Uh, usage. Now, ultimately, what we're doing is trying to get as many people to buy the platform, right? It's a software suite and a platform that you can do this episodic stuff to your heart's content on and try to run some evergreen stuff. So we, we encourage people to do, um, you know, there are essentially three categories that we've evolved to in terms of these applications. Promotions, right, which is this kind of stuff, uh, referral offers, and engagement applications. Engagement and referrals can be more persistent, right? So, uh, you guys know Book Renter, uh, being in school, right? It's kind of like Chegg, uh, a textbook service. So, they're a customer and they have a referral offer that's just going all the time, right? Hey, go get, uh, you know, go get uh, a friend to come sign up for the service. You get five bucks, they get five bucks, right? And that's on all the time. Um, and so, they put that post order on the post confirm page, you know. Uh, website, uh, you know, et cetera. So um, we have a lot of customers that are doing more of that, uh, what I call persistent use case as well. And are they all in the context of this, uh, I guess, deal-related or discount lead generation? Like no, yeah, there's, uh, there are a number, so within each of those three categories, right, there are a number of different apps. So there could be a voting application, literally just, you know, uh, Molson Coors is a customer. So they did, a, they did something uh, as part of a big launch uh, at the NHL season, you know, hey, we're going to give away two tickets to the uh, All-Star game. Uh, vote on your favorite headline from the NHL season. And then they wrap the sweepstakes into that with our sweepstakes app. All right, so there are about 15, 16 apps, and, you know, and that's a growing list. So there are lots of different, what I call, uh, social engagement applications, commenting, ratings, group deals, flash deals, et cetera. So, you know, you want to have a palette of those because you know, one size isn't going to fit all every time. Yeah. Now that um, more and more people are getting connected on Facebook, I think Facebook has their default settings so that you only kind of see in your feed um, the news from, you know, people you interact with the most. So is there a way for you to tag this with, um, if I've liked for any certain in the past, and just another little tag with some music that I like, that if a friend that I never interact with and I never would normally see their, anything from their news feed, if they shared it, it would automatically get pushed into my feed just because the tagging? Yeah. Uh, we don't do that today. That's it's, a, it's an interesting thing to explore. I'm not sure what, I'll have to ask our guys, what Facebook allows in terms of that, uh, that sort of data. You know, the obvious, you know, we've shown a Facebook example here, but this works with Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Facebook is the 800-pound gorilla, uh, and as you might imagine, they have a lot of terms of service uh, that we always want to stay on the right side of. Um, but that's a, that's a really interesting idea. I'll, I'll look into that. Do you ever look at clout as a sort of competitor at all? Or I mean, this seems like a more useful clout, maybe a clout with a business model. Yeah. Uh, no, I, very different. I mean, <laughs> a guy that used to work for me is now running product at clout. So uh, uh, I consider them friends. Um, we've actually uh, talked about integrating, right? So in this whole thing, putting a, another little column on there that has their clout score. Um, but I believe, you know, I'm horribly biased, uh, that that's less relevant because I actually don't know what it, my clout score is right now. But whatever it is, is almost entirely tied to my presence in the social CRM market and et cetera, et cetera. And so the fact that REI might try to target me or leverage me somehow based on my, uh, my clout score 
doesn't make a lot of sense to me because people aren't listening to me about backpacks, right? But that's all they have to work with is this generalized notion. This stuff is horribly specific, right? This person, David Jordan or Jane Smith, probably has a clout score close to zero. But on this particular topic or this particular product or that whatever category, they're really relevant. And so I might miss some of that stuff. So I think about them as you know, perhaps complementary, um, definitely not competitive. Just out of curiosity, do you have uh, like a Tumblr button and a Pinterest button? Like how many buttons, you know, how many? How many networks? Mm -hmm. uh, you probably won't be surprised to know that about 98% of the sharing happens on Facebook and Twitter. And if it's a B2B customer, right, IBM's a customer, it's, uh, you know, Marketo's a customer, uh, you know, it's LinkedIn. Um, so 99.5% of the sharing happens on those three networks. Uh, we have, you know, we have some others, but we've started to realize there's a diminishing return uh, to adding a lot of those at this point. I think if you try to stumble upon, you might discover something interesting. That's a good thought. It's a much bigger network these days than yeah. Good thought. All right, I'll get it back to you. Well, we're going to uh, ham and egg this next section uh, because mainly this is uh, a little bit of the history of Crowd Factory and, and how they got to where they are now, which is what Sanjay just took you through. So, when we first invested, which was about three years ago, uh, the initial position of the company uh, was really a platform, a white label platform for enterprises um, that did. A lot of the things that, that Sanjay talked about, but it was an enterprise sell. We actually had to go in there and sell to customers like Martha Stewart, HBO, Comcast, VH1, uh, direct sales force, ASP around 10K a month. Uh, but here were the challenges. Obviously, with an enterprise sell, it's a long sales cycle. The biggest challenge we had was that they, we had to basically do a complete overhaul of their web presence or wait for them to do that overhaul of their web presence to get our white label technology integrated. Uh, so timing of that was huge. Uh, and you know, we had one-offs and we had some success, uh, but it also required heavy IT and labor components from the customer. Uh, so that was, that was the first real major challenge. Um, anything you wanna add to that before we go to the kind of like first iteration? Uh, so, you know, full disclosure, I joined the company about a year and a half ago. Uh, but the reason I was familiar with Crowd Factory was because uh, the company I was at before, Lithium Technologies, we'd actually looked at trying to buy Crowd Factory uh, because the technology uh, stack was so uh, so strong. But you know, embedded in this notion was, as they started building this, Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn sort of hadn't showed up, right? right? If you think about how fast and far the world has come in a short period of time, um, and so at that point. The only thing you were really left with was how do we make the website social, and so that's where the company started. How long ago was this? That was 2008, 08, uh, early nine, um, and this was when we realized uh, management and the board realized that we got some serious challenges. We're not going to scale the way we want to given these challenges. So what do we do? How do we iterate to really start to get that ramp? Um, so really, we kind of went through um, this first iteration, which was trying to address these challenges that we had. Uh, we said, all right, well, we've got this fabulous platform. Uh, why don't we, instead of trying to make it integrated into an existing customer's web presence, i.e. get designed into it, uh, find out ways that we can actually get into their campaigns and be implemented within days. Uh, so what happened was we started coming down as far the stack as far as the size of companies that we were going after and size of customers. Um, still an enterprise sale, lowering the price point. Um, what was really interesting though was this was still uh, at a very nascent part of the market when it came to social. Uh, this was probably mid late 09. It was about when you came in, Sanjay, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, early 10. Early 10. Yep. And one of the things that we were, we were finding out is as we were going down that stack from a standpoint of customers uh, was that everyone said, you'd go to talk to a marketer and says, yeah, I'm supposed to be doing something social. And they're like, great, we can help you. And then they'd look at you with this blank face of, I don't know what to do. Well, you can do anything. 
Well, they didn't want to be told they could do anything. They wanted to be told you can do X, Y, and Z, and here's how you do it. And that was a real challenge that we had with this first iteration, uh, was we had this unbelievably uh, versatile platform, which was fabulous, but in the, in the end, it actually created a problem for us because we could do anything, and the customer says, great, we can do anything. We're now starting to do one-offs for every one of our customers, and we're almost into a consulting business, <coughs> which then destroys your margins because you can't resell the same product a million times. Right. So again, we had challenges in this iteration. Part of it was also the market was iterating. So, you know, this whole social thing has only been in the last few years that it's really <coughs> taken off. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the couple of things that, that I tag onto that, the, the notion of the buyer, again, coming back to Greg's first slide and knowing what you want to do and what you're going after and doing it in these short loops, uh, you know, that first iteration based on that web infrastructure sale, I mean, you're selling to IT people, right? You're selling to webmasters and come as quickly as you can to the realization that, yep, that's my buyer or nope, that's not my buyer, right? So in this iteration, it was a major shift to, we're gonna go sell to the marketer, right? And then go as quickly as you can, learn what's important to the marketer and how you think, right? So we took a little bit of that half step of, we're gonna take the power of this platform and just bring it to the marketer. And then what we had to learn very quickly is, yeah, but the marketer is a different bird than that IT person, right? I, it's got to be idiot proof for a guy like me coming out of the box. It's got to have a nice package around it. Here's what you're going to do with it. Don't make me think. Um, as opposed to the value proposition that we might have thought was, wow, the flexibility of this is terrific. You know, that actually could work against you, again, depending on who you're selling to. So always remember, you know, that you're iterating on a little bit of a multivariate equation of your you know, product capability set with the fit of the person or the buyer or the role or title that you're trying to sell to. Yeah. And that kind of brings us to where we are now, which is, uh, well, let me go back one, which is really um, what Sanjay was talking about is we have this platform and we have applications on this platform, which you can pull down, whether it's a sweepstakes uh, tool or a polling pool or a uh, group buying uh, application. We run the platform, but you can, we can get you up and going almost within minutes within these applications. And the whole idea then is to get the customer to get started with these applications and then buy the platform. Uh, again, we're coming down that, that pyramid of customers from dealing with the very high end to dealing with at the very high end, the very top, down to small size businesses now. Uh, and in doing that, we've had to change our sales model from an enterprise and a telesales approach, we've changed our ASP to allow for these customers to get on board faster. So our ASP now is more like $2,000 a month. And then hopefully the idea is you start off small and then you, you ramp them up. Uh, what's interesting now is that we've, Sanjay has done a lot of this uh, and where we are now is, is go back to your question on these campaigns, is how, uh, the campaigns are very episodic, you know, and with these marketers, it's so great, you know, CrowdFactory is awesome. We use it every, for every one of our campaigns. We run three campaigns a year and they're six weeks long. Well, from a business standpoint, we're not getting revenue for 40, 36 weeks a, a, a year, right? That doesn't work. So it's these episodic driven uh, value props that we need to, to, to overcome. Um, the other thing is, is we've created a little bit more vo velocity on deals because we've simplified it. So you can come on their website and basically take an app and be up and running within minutes. Uh, now, how do you then create the business model to maximize the dollars that you're going to pull out of that customer? Um, the other thing that's interesting is that there are some players out there that are very service oriented, kind of almost an iteration uh, behind us and saying we'll provide a lot of services, a lot of people to hold your hand and walk you through all that. You know, whether or not they end up being successful is almost irrelevant at this point, we're having to compete with them. So how do you compete with someone who's willing to throw bodies at it and it's customer service when you don't want to have to because you know that model that isn't sustainable? Um, what else before we kind of get into the challenge that I missed? 
those are the key things, and you know, we talked about it a little bit. So what we've taken in this iteration is a add the pieces, right, that remove the objections. Uh, you know, instead of saying, no, you don't want to do episodic stuff, add something that they can do all the time, right, that's always on, and then let them do the episodic stuff, right? Um, and uh, to Greg's point, adding the services capabilities uh, so that, hey, look, if you want help, we're here for you. We're experts. We've seen it, you know, in lots of places, et cetera. So we remove the objection, and that's, you know, that's uh, helping us. And it's all, again, discovery in this iteration cycle of, okay, how do we crank this thing down, you know, to shorter and shorter sales cycles. Um, maybe I'll open up to some questions before we get into the challenge for your workshop. Sure. I find it interesting that, like, you know, you're going to say consulting slash marketing and IT. And I'm curious, like, where do you think, like, your revenue and salaries are? And, like, you, you mentioned your first time you guys talked to the IT folks, and now I'm not thinking. I'm guessing now you probably bring anyone to the table. Uh, ironically, because of this notion of packaging it, making it easy, uh, we rarely actually end up interacting with the IT folks. Um, where we will end up with IT folks, it generally has to do with security stuff. But one of the lessons learned, again, in the iteration, again, you, you can't possibly learn enough about your customers, right, uh, was that marketers uh, really don't like the IT guys. <laughs> Not because they're bad people. The IT guys are always oversubscribed. They always have way too much to do. And when marketing is required to put some put a ticket in with IT you know hey we need some help because we need to get this onto our website etc um, they just get put at the back of the line for whatever reason right it's a Rodney Dangerfield uh, effect of the organization so you know one of the other things that we didn't talk about in this uh, you see it here on the first box one of the other iterations in the cycle was adding the cross-channel capability that we talked about uh, that I described earlier uh, because what we realized is, you know, in the second iteration where we were focused again on that web presence, uh, we realized that a lot of marketers didn't have access to their own websites. They had to go get somebody's permission to touch that web presence. And so if we added the capability to drop it into email, added the capability to pop up a landing page, added the capability to publish to their Facebook page, which they did own, right? IT hasn't yet taken over the Facebook page. They were thrilled. Right, so you know that was another uh, thing that we added in this in this iteration cycle, so that we can stay as focused on the conversation with the marketer, because that means a sales cycle about this long, as opposed to that long. And uh, did you meet any challenges um, regarding human resources and complexity in the team when you have to con continue? Yes. Yeah, within within the the crowd factory team. Yeah. Um, I, yes, is the short answer, but in a constructive way, I think. And that's, that's very important in terms of the culture you build, you know, as you all build your companies. Particularly when you're a startup, you don't have a lot of people to begin with. You got to make sure that there's a, a culture and a willingness and an openness uh, for everybody to engage in the, the debate about which direction are we going, what did we learn on this iteration, what decision are we going to make as a result. And then once the decision's been made, you know, even if not 100% uh, consensus, that everybody then gets on, gets on board to go chase it through the next iteration. Um, and so I think that's healthy. Uh, it, cannot, it can be destructive, I'm sure. But, uh, but I think you want that because, frankly, that forces better thinking. Um, well, and just the, the iterations that we went through with Crowd, they were pretty significant. So. Uh, the culture is so important, but just taking that aside, we went from an enterprise cell to really a telecell. You know, we had salespeople that were enterprise oriented. They're not this, the DNA that you need for this type of business model. So we iterated our business model and our sales strategy so much that the people that we had in there to run those plays, they weren't, they weren't set for that. They weren't the right fits for that. And they recognized it too. And that goes to part of the discussion of as you debate which way do you go, how do you go, you always have to understand, well, people are self-interested. So, of course, the, the enterprise sales guy is saying, no, we need to stay on the enterprise because he wants to make sure that he has a job. Well, you need to look at the institutional imperative of the company. What's more important? There's, the company is more important than any single individual. 
And if we need to iterate to go to a more self-service model, to a telesales model, well, this person who's an enterprise sales guy, it's not the right fit. So there are those challenges. And I go back to, to what Sanjay said, making sure you have the right culture that you're open to having those debates uh, and understanding that it's the institutional imperative, it's the company that's the most important and that you iterate to that. And then as he said, once you make that decision, everybody's on board and you run with it. Sure. For these um, enterprise sales guys, is it, can you not teach them how to sell other ways? Or are they still <laughs> set in their, like, their ways that it's hard to change them? Uh, I have found sales guys are really hard to change. <laughs> uh, they know what they're good at, they go do it. And the idea is finding the guys that are good for the plays you're running. <coughs> and then plug them in and let them go. Uh, re-educating, retooling a sales guy, really hard. I don't know what your experience yeah, has been. No, I mean, uh, literally I've quantified it before. Of, of 10 uh, salespeople that, you know, don't fit a new model, uh, I've had one uh, that has actually transitioned. transitioned and, you know, and turned out to be great. Uh, but it's to Greg's point, uh, you know, if you're looking for the litmus test and the rules, because you know, to move fast, you need the rules. The, the rule is you know, find, find the player who's built for right. the play that you need to run. Just kind of out of curiosity, was that one guy younger than the rest, or <laughs> mm -hmm. sort of less molded? Actually, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. yeah. So going to your point, I was just thinking that uh, as you're building something, you're bringing on salespeople, and you don't know what your model is yet, mm -hmm. the, the younger people are able to adapt as opposed to if you've run the play a few times and it's successful, that's what you know and that's what you get hired for, and then you have to be you know, pivoted to run something else, it's kind of harder to do. Yeah. Sure. So it seems like another way that this could have gone would be you get to stage one and it's kind of working, and you just keep pressing and pressing. And so I'm, I'm just curious if Crowd Factory has always been a learning company, and that's from day one, or if there was some impetus where it's like, yeah, we're making a little bit of money, but then your board really pushed you to, to like take it to another level, or how, how that kind of happened? You could probably speak to Yeah, the one. first iteration was, um, was sales ramp, primarily. That was the biggest issue that we had. Um, the customers loved us. It was unbelievable. Customers, you know, they would have thrown us more money. But it was, it was not an order of magnitude more money that would have changed our sales ramp problem. Uh, it just took too long. And it was happening at a, at a time when social was becoming much more accepted. You know, this is kind of 08, 09. And we knew that there was a market here. And we knew that we were missing it, or we would miss it, if we didn't change our model. That was really the, the impetus for it. Uh, we could have kept doing this. The technology is phenomenal. And we could have positioned this thing to get sold and probably made a little bit of money, but we wouldn't have built the company we think that we can build if we would have stayed with that. Uh, so it was really a combination of we weren't ramping fast enough, we knew the market was going to explode, and we had to iterate. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that I would add is, uh, you know, we haven't talked about it explicitly, but this notion of iterating is it's not just about your customer, right? Watching the broader market yep. and what's happening, you know, is another variate in that multivariate equation, right? And so the fact that all of a sudden the social networks emerged meant that you had to, you had to think about where the puck was going to be as opposed to where the puck is now. Because um, I think that's a big risk uh, as you sort of embark on something, particularly when you conceive of it and it's your baby, et cetera, is, you know, right now, yeah, it could be going okay. But if you're not sort of, you know, to use a sports analogy, running with your eyes up, uh, you're going to miss the fact that downfield here a little bit, it's not going to be uh, the same as it is now for not reasons that have to do with your product or business, but have to do with the broader market and or new competitors, uh, et cetera. And so I think, you know, being aware of all of those things at the same time, um, you know, serves, serves you well. So um, when you're iterating each time and when everyone's discussing how to take the company and whatever the final decision is, I'm sure some people kind of are hurt a little bit that it didn't go their way. And do you see sort of a loss in motivation in those people or how do you deal with that? And 
what yeah I mean I, I wish I wish I could tell you there was an easy answer for that um, you know it, it absolutely happens all the time um, you know and then ultimately how it gets resolved is some function of uh, you know, the, the broader team dynamics and, you know, frankly, the people on either side of that equation, the person whose way it went and the person whose way it didn't go uh, and how, uh, how they interact and whether they have a good enough uh, relationship to sort of say, hey, look, it's not personal, it's about the business uh, and you have that orientation. Um, I will say, uh, and, and I've had, you know, on balance, way more work well than not. Um, but in the, in the cases where it just doesn't look like the person's going to get there, um, it's kind of like you know, the sales reps that we were talking about. The better thing for you to do is no harm, no foul. You, we just don't have the right fit here, and that person should exit uh, the business just because you can't afford to have a passive-aggressive element, particularly in a small team, right? Sure. I mean, my job is to live paranoid, right? Um, so uh, on one hand, yes. Uh, on the other hand, uh, no, because the scale at which they have to operate means that their business model has to be uh, much more ad-like. Um, and it has to you know, <coughs> scale out through an ecosystem, just like Google's you know, paid search model, right? Um, which means the likelihood that they want to get into this kind of enterprise software essentially, um, you know, is probably lower. Um, now, what I have to watch is around the edges, things that affect what we do, and it gets back into the iteration, right? So every time Google, uh, Google Facebook comes out and says, you know, hey, we're releasing some more of these open graph applications, right? The first one was the like button, uh, but now they've started to, you know, push out a few others. Uh, we need to react very quickly and figure out what does that mean for us? Or when they release the timeline capability, okay, what does that mean for us? Um, and so, it, that's a great example of you know running with your eyes up because the way the world looks right now, you know, is probably not the way it's going to look you know downfield. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious about what you have found um, in terms of social sharing on Facebook versus Twitter, and also um, you mentioned earlier about email sharing and if you're able to track any data. From yep. That. Uh, so short, quick answers, uh, lots more sharing on Facebook, way more resulting visits from Twitter. Um, email, uh, very good results. Uh, we just had one, you know, it's almost a two to one lift on impressions, right? And so you can send an email to 200,000 people. If you've got the right social application inside it, you know, I think I told you about that Molson example, right? with the NHL hockey tickets, uh, that got put in the feeds of another 125,000 people. Those are people that Molson never knew about. And so now you have an opportunity to go cultivate relationships as, as those people start to come back, et cetera. So uh, it, uh, it can be, uh, I actually think email is one of the more powerful applications in social, ironically, right? Because everybody's been talking about email is dead. Uh, I'm curious, we're old school. You yeah. guys are younger. How do you view that? Do you think email is a good marketing tool or not? You do. I see heads nodding. Okay. It's, it's more personal than Facebook. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's interesting. I have a question in that, in that, sure. Oh, in that vein. So I've got a unique experience, but you know, for me with Facebook, whenever I see somebody post something, if it isn't a status update, I'm inclined or a picture, I'm inclined to ignore it, right? And, mm -hmm. and I feel like that's something that has been increasing in my usage and in my peer group's usage. And Facebook is obviously well saturated, but have you started experimenting with other, you know, since this is C to C, have you started experimenting with, well, where are the C's seeing each other, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and if there's a lot of high engagement on, say, Tumblr is one that I'm throwing out there because people are reblogging all the freaking time, how much of that do you guys have to spend time thinking about in terms of yeah. how you then go your enterprise? Yeah, no, we have to be thinking about it all the time. Uh, are you experimental there, or is, that, is there stuff that you're Yeah, uh, for sure, right, because not only do we, you know, we instrument the product to figure out, you know, where people are traveling within the product, then we are watching the aggregate data of 
all of our customers' activity, right? To sort of see what are the patterns, you know. So I'm not instead of looking just at Molson, if I look at, you know, ten customers, you know, where where is the traffic coming from? You know, back to this uh, Twitter, Facebook uh, question, et cetera, and start to see if there are new places uh, that are emerging or this particular customer had a spike of traffic on this. Why was that? You know, did it have to do with the time of day? Right. We learn about that stuff. Uh, did it have to do with some exogenous event? Uh, you know, the South Carolina primary, uh, or <laughs> did it have to do with you know where it was? You know, in terms of the network, et cetera. So, um, yeah, we have to be watching all of that. Um, if you're aggregating data across all of your customers, um, how do you see that evolving in the future in terms of how you're going to use that maybe to price discriminate uh, on future campaigns if you know that one customer is more valuable to you than another or whatever? Yeah. Um, so here's some iteration cycles that, that we see emerging with the data. You know, once we get a little more scale with that data, the first thing is we can start doing benchmarking, right? And I can use that either as a differentiation in the sale or actually charge them for it. Meaning, you know, hey, CPG companies like you, here's what good is for them. Share rates of 30% or interaction rates of 15%, et cetera. And if you're below that, well, then let's, you know, you might want to buy some services or, you know, if you're above that, then terrific. But you only get that visibility with us. So that's, that's one uh, bit of value, um, you know. Uh, as you turn the crank again, that data can help us identify even narrower segments, right? Um, we're by no means done on this iteration thing, right? We're talking about selling to marketers. To me, that makes me lose sleep. You know, I want to know even more narrowly because not every marketer is created equal for me, right? I know in my gut that, you know, there is this segment of marketers and verticals that are really good for us and the rest of them aren't that data will help us figure that out, right? Uh, and then the third bit at really large scale is we could probably start selling that data, right? And in terms of, you know, whether it's ad targeting or, you know, lots of other interesting things. But to me, I think that's a third growth cycle out. It's a good thought. So embedded in those, um, in those messages are tracking, essentially unique tracking links. So inside this Jane Smith message here, uh, every time somebody shares, literally every time our systems auto-generate a specific unique link to that person, to that piece of content, to that place. And so we literally will know now if anybody clicks on that, we can tie that you know, that daisy chain activity all the way back to... How do I know? Like, once I've clicked on it, how ah, do I know yeah. that so, so on the, uh, a, a part of the application, right, is now because we can trace it through that link, we've associated it with you in that particular offer. And so uh, there is, as part of these applications, a track progress um, game. Essentially, it's a game element, right? So people keep coming back, and they're hitting refresh. You know, did I get it? Did I get it? And if you haven't, guess what that makes you do? You promote it more, right? Um, and so, uh, so that's that's the specific user experience on how you know. Um, and then once it tips over, so you may not, you may not go back and check at all, and you're just sort of letting your feed do the work. Once the once it tips over, uh, if there is something to be fulfilled, our system will also automatically send you an email that says, "Hey, you just got ten people to hit the Brittany thing. Here's your code." Oh, actually, oh, I was curious it. about. Facebook where they start to bring the most important posts at the top of the Sure, the whole edge rank thing, et cetera. Um, absolutely. There, and there's no silver bullet. It's why, you know, it's part of the value proposition here is with the analytics, you are learn. you know, we tell marketers, look, there is no silver bullet, right? Because of edge rank, because of all these things, you have to learn what works and what doesn't work for you and continue to optimize. Um, and that's what the data does for you. I think I just we're 
pricing you do it by month. I'm curious, do you ever try to do it like by click so five percent revenue is generated above forecast through online commerce? Uh, or do you like you know, target like different um, companies will get different pricing models? Yeah. Um, We've tried to keep it simple, uh, which is why we've got the monthly subscription. Uh, one of the objectives, again, back to the know where you want to go, is we want recurring revenue. Um, and so we've tried to keep it simple in that way. There's no question we've been asked about pay-per-click models, et cetera. Um, and we've done some experimentation. Uh, and we'll see, again, what, what takes off. Uh, there is a segment of customers for us, publishers, Right, um, you know, people who make money by selling ad inventory uh, that would love to use our applications inside ad units and sell that to their customers on the same basis that they sell all their other ad units, which is CPM basis. In which case, we do you know essentially a rev share on CPM. So you know, we'll experiment you know with those things, and you know, the next time we come to class and talk about the next iteration, it might be that we've gone completely to the ad. Uh, uh, pay-per-click model. I don't know. We'll see. So we wanted to come up with a challenge that you guys can work through in your workshop uh, that actually helps us. We wanted to tap into your horsepower. Uh, so uh, it actually is trying to address our current challenges, which is this episodic nature of campaign <laughs> business. Uh, how do you overcome that? Uh, and then the other aspect that we'd love for your guys' thoughts on is we're starting to generate a greater velocity of deals. How do you maintain that, increase it, and do it in a way that starts to drive revenue. Because you can do a lot of it by free, but then how do you convert that into extracting the dollars from your customer? So that's our challenge currently, and it's your challenge now for your workshop. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.